Aloha and welcome to another extremely, exceptionally exciting and the Energy Man. Dan Osterman here calling to you from deep within the heart of Kailua in Honolulu, Hawaii, the county of Honolulu. And uh, we're, we're going to stick in Hawaii today for our show and we're going to talk more Hawaii energy thing, um, particularly some of the less common um, renewable energy sources and storage mediums that uh, we actually have available to us here in Hawaii. Um, and to address those issues, I have a, a colleague, I'd like to call him a colleague, I, I'm probably not his peer, that's for sure, uh, Marco Magelsdorf. He uh, actually, I think the first time I associated with him was on a think tech show that Jay Fidel couldn't host called um, uh, Mina, Marco, and Me, and Jay couldn't be on it, so he asked me to host the show. and. That was the first time I think I talked to Marco, but I know Mina from uh, a long time ago at the PUC and, and working hydrogen issues. Uh, Marco, thanks for joining us today. And, and uh, thanks again for helping with that town hall uh, last week. That uh, seemed to go over pretty well. At least um, Kai was happy with it. And I got some good feedback from some of the folks that watched it. So um, Marco, to could you tell the audience a little bit more about yourself? I know you've been on before, but um, just trying yeah, to- well, first of all, Stan, a big pleasure to be with you, just the two of us. It's uh, something I've looked forward to doing for quite a while. So it's, it's a real treat for me. So greetings to, from, uh, from beautiful Hilo town, Hawaii, here in the Big Island. So yeah, about me, well, I've been doing uh, renewable energy, principally solar for 42 years now, coming up on 42 as of next month, which kind of dates me as one of these old old renewable energy guys, although I don't have a gray beard because I choose not to uh, not to have a gray beard. So uh, I've been doing that for a very long time. I've been at ProVision Solar for 20 years. Uh, I moved here in 2000. Yeah, ProVision Solar was then ProVision Technologies, part of Hawaiian Electric Industries, an un unregulated subsidiary, kind of sort of like uh, Pacific Current is now, uh, the, the latest um, uh, new company from, uh, Hawaiian Electric Industries. And we are kind of a middling uh, solar energy contractor. Uh, I'm a licensed electrical contractor as well as uh, supervising electrician in the state of Hawaii. So I've gotten, uh, gotten my, my, uh, my knowledge from the, the ground up, so to speak, by actually doing it. And I also, uh, on a parallel track over the decades, I, I got a PhD in political science from University of California, Davis, and I've taught both at UH Hilo, University of California, Cal State System. That said, uh, these past years, my, my train, the Marco train, has been principally in renewable energy, although I, I have a, a, an idea for a new course that I've been kind of gestating for the past several years that I'm very interested in doing, which just briefly would be looking at energy security politics and the environment along the Mekong River, Southeast Asia, where I've had the uh, pleasure of getting a chance to explore a fair amount past several years and I plan to be back there again before too long once the COVID craziness stops and the country start opening their borders again. So so I'll just leave it at that. But gee, I didn't know that um, that you had that kind of bent because uh, when I was at US PACOM, Vietnam was one of the countries that I did bilateral defense dialogues with. And uh, my last trip to Vietnam was actually attending a Mekong Delta Initiative uh, conference. So hey, we should get together and talk about that because I think that would be a great, great um, subject for you to be teaching. Um, I have a bachelor's from UH and a master's in um, international relations from University of Oklahoma. And uh, man, we should team up on that stuff. Love to. Good, Love good to. thing we're doing this show. I, I'm learning all kinds of stuff about my guests. At any rate, let's get back on topic. Um, you know, here in Hawaii, we actually have quite a few options in terms of clean, carbon-free, renewable energy. And of course, um, you know, you've been in the solar business and, you know, we have wind too, um, but talking to a lot of the constituents and some of the legislators here, you know, wind has a kind of a mixed appeal. Um, it's, it's okay, but until it's in your neighborhood and then the people really don't like it. So I'm not real bullish on wind here in Hawaii. Um, but we have solar, we have wind, we have geothermal, which is potentially a game changer here in the state. Um, and then we have some kind of um, 
more traditional ones like uh, hydroelectric that I don't think people really think that much about. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the Big Island has in terms of hydroelectric? Sure, sure. Well, let me kind of riff a little bit off of what you said earlier, Stan, which is, you know, one of the things uh, that uh, I tell people freely is uh, there's no such thing as a free energy lunch, which uh, I mean, what I mean by that is simply that every energy source has its upside and has its downside. So, you know, while wind turbines tend to maybe be more visible from a great distance, they certainly are because they can be through 400 feet. Uh, there's also some pushback at times toward you know, large scale solar farms, depending on where they happen to be, right? So uh, there's no cost free choice in terms of energy. And here on the big island, I believe we are blessed more so than perhaps any other island in the chain, as far as having sun, of course, having two wind farms that have been going for a number of years now, one down to South Point and another in uh, uh, North uh, Kohala, Javi. We have uh, some hydro on this island, not a whole lot in terms of the, uh, the percentage is rather small of the total, uh, total generation portfolio. And then we have uh, Puna Geothermal Venture, PGV for short in Lower Puna, which has been out for two and a half years or so. And there's actually gonna be a virtual town hall meeting tomorrow that ORMAT and PGV will be doing, which I'll be attending, so to speak, kind of want to get an update on what's going on with them. And as we talked a little bit before we went on the air, there's also the potential on this island for what's known as pumped hydro, which to, uh, for the lay, uh, layman and laywoman, uh, what that is essentially is you take water, assuming you have water to take, you pump it uphill, you store it in a reservoir, and then you let it come back down. And when it comes back down, of course, it's got some gravity feed and, uh, and energy as it's flowing uh, down through the pipe and you spin it through a turbine. Now, of course, the law of physics says you will never get the same energy out that you put in to get up there. But nonetheless, it's seen as, a, as something that can be done in certain instances on certain islands or certain terrains if there's adequate water to be able to use essentially surplus power produced, let's say, by the sun that the grid can't take at any given time where the batteries, more conventional batteries happen to be full, or from a wind farm that instead of curtailing the output of the wind farm, you can use that to pump water uphill. So KIUC, my friends at Koi Island Utility Co-op are, have been pursuing a pumped hydro project for a number of years now and I don't know exactly when they expect to go online, but I know they are going through the final hurdles to be able to hopefully before too long actually go live, which will be the first pumped hydro that I know, pumped hydro, pumped hydro project here in the state, which hopefully will serve as a guide, kind of do's and don'ts for other potential projects. So. I think we're very blessed here on the Big Island in terms of being able to get to uh, close to 100%, perhaps sooner and faster than any other major island. Now, Molokai could conceivably vault ahead of us if they, because that's a small grid, small number of customers, and if they have a multi megawatt solar plus storage, they could conceivably get to 80, 90% within a handful of years. But in terms of Maui, the Big Island, uh, Oahu and Kauai. Now, Kauai, I have to take my hat off to Dave Bissell and his crew there. Yeah. I mean, within the next, I'm going to say, year two, they could easily be somewhere in the 80% range in terms of renewable. So, uh, you know, we're, uh, we have a ways to go uh, here on the island, uh, here on the big island. And we took a hit when PGV went down two and a half years ago in terms of our total percentage of renewables. But you know, Hawaiian Electric has big plans for 100 plus megawatts of additional solar here uh, in terms of utility scale, hundreds of megawatt hours of storage. They're supporting more and more rooftop solar. So it's just going to continue to be very, very dynamic, Stan. I'm, I'm convinced of that. And there are going to be challenges along the way and stakeholders, you know, understandably going for their position. And uh, I don't see it as a particularly rosy path. It never is. But the, the potential is there, the goodwill is there, the consensus is there, and it, we just got to continue, continue to walk the walk uh, as we talk the talk. Well, if it wasn't for the neighbor islands, Hawaiian Electric couldn't claim all the renewable energy that they own because you couldn't put more than much more solar 
or wind on Oahu than they already have. They've pretty much saturated their grid with intermittent renewables um, at around 18%. And they're probably pressing a little over 20% now. And they're, they're getting to the point where there's certain areas where they won't uh, entertain interconnect agreements anymore with solar because that particular sector of their grid is overpopulated with intermittent renewables. <clears throat> so it's, it's you know, we're kind of looking at the, the, there's the more basic uh, grids, like on, like you say, Molokai in particular, uh, Kauai and the Big Island are a little bit easier to manage than Oahu's industrial, you know, touristy Waikiki, huge scale high rise buildings kind of uh, fluctuations you get from those big, you know, power suckers. Um, so we, we kind of have to almost overproduce on the neighbor islands to help Oahu. And then it gets into how are you going to move that power from neighbor islands to Oahu? And we've already looked at undersea cables and things. And um, I don't know that that's going to work. So we can, we can talk about options for that. My favorite would be either hydrogen um, as a liquid hydrogen or possibly ammonia. But ammonia comes with its own set of uh, drawbacks and things too. But let's talk about the pumped hydro just a little bit. In KIUC's case of, on Kauai, how do you know about how much they're storing in terms of gallons? And are they storing in tanks or are they, or are they building like small reservoirs? I believe it's a reservoir, Stan. And I'm afraid uh, it's not something I've boned up particularly. I mean, I kind of keep it. Yeah. Keep an eye on it from afar, and I have uh, you know, contacts and friends at KIUC to uh, because I'm I'm very supportive of what uh, they've been doing, and very big and uh, you know very big fan of co-ops in general. So I'm I'm not really privy to the uh, the details. Uh, I do know it's been it's been a long a long slog, uh, understandably because as we both know, anytime you deal with water, uh, changing the natural course from point A to point B, or even if they think it's being changed. Even if you take it, if you move it temporarily up and you bring it down and it's going to go exactly where it went to anyway in the end, um, you, you get the multiple layers of the government get involved and have to study it and analyze it and approve it and, and it goes out for public comment and on and on and on. But as far as I know, I mean, I, you know, I, until they start pumping their first gallons up that pipe, store it and then have it come down and spin a turbine, they probably won't quite be ready to, you know, break out the champagne. But I, I, I do believe they're getting closer and closer to, to being able to do that in the not too distant future. Well, are, are most of their permitting issues federal or state or county, do you think, or a combination of all? Probably a combination of all. And you've got the Public Utilities Commission, of course, which is involved as well as it must be because it's, of course, representing the interest of the public, you know, writ large. So there are multiple layers of approval. And, you know, whenever you do something like this, it's not for the faint hearted, right? Nor <laughs> for someone who demands immediate satisfaction because that's not going to happen for, for something like this. But you know, clearly they believe KIC does that it's, it's worth whatever effort they're putting into it and will allow them to continue to build up the, the greater capacity, greater generation capacity for, for intermittent renewables, non-firm as utility calls it, and be able to uh, use the excess to pump up the water up and then have it come down when, when the sun don't shine and the wind don't blow. It is uh, the guy Remington, is it Brad Remington? Is their operations guy over there? Uh, Brad Rockwell is one Rockwell, of the, Rockwell. One of the guys. Yeah, Brad's a, yeah. a great guy, yeah. Yeah, I need to get him back on the show. I, I think I interviewed him from Kauai on my first moonshot where I was broadcasting from Kauai from the McDonald's in uh, <laughs> by Port Allen um, while the people were going to the bathroom behind me and he was, he was in his office and we were doing a shot all the way back to Honolulu. But uh, yeah, he's a really sharp guy and um, I'll have to talk to him about his pump um, hydro. We're going to take a quick break here and um, throw up some think tech uh, thank yous. And then we'll be back in 60 seconds to talk more with Marco on some of uh, Hawaii's renewable energy and sustainability options. Thank you. 
Hey, welcome back to Stan, the energy man of Stan Osterman and Marco Mengelsdorf. Uh, I'm on Oahu, he's on the Big Island, but we're talking Hawaii energy no matter where you are. And uh, we just were talking a little bit about pumped hydro, which is not very often spoken about, but the theory is that when you have surplus energy from solar, wind, or any other <clears throat> generation source and you can't use the power, you use it to pump water uphill to a, a reservoir, a tank, and then when you need the power, you let the water run downhill through a turbine um, to another reservoir and let it sit there until you have excess electricity again. Then you pump the same water back up the hill. And of course, it means you need a source of water because you can have evaporation and stuff like that. But um, it's a technique that um, we're experimenting with on the island of Kauai. And Marco gave us a little um, uh, briefing on that. Um, but it's amazing. We have um, in Hawaii, when we had sugarcane and pineapple, we had quite an extensive irrigation system here in the state of Hawaii. And a lot of it has fallen into disrepair or just, you know, not being used, or maybe some of it's being pulled off for um, potable water for the, the rest of the state. But there's an awful lot of uh, water available, especially on Kauai and on the Big Island, probably Maui too. It could be turned into um, clean, uh, what we call in-stream hydroelectric, or uh, just take a little bit of water out of an old sugarcane flume, run it through a, a generator turbine, and then back into the same sugarcane flume and let it run downhill. So, uh, Marco, on, on the Big Island, how many examples of that are, are you aware of that, that are in use right now? Well, there's a utility scale hydro plant uh, along the Wailuku River in and around Hilo. My recollection, ooh, five to 10 megawatts. So, you know, you look at the total or peak demand for this island in terms of power somewhere 180 to 190 megawatts. So clearly five lower even 10 megawatts is kind of a, a drop in the uh, drop in the bucket, so to speak. And there are a number of other kind of private hydro plants. Uh, you know, our friend Richard Haw has one that's been legal for now quite a number of years. Uh, Ed Campbell, who uh, I forget what his legacy is, so shame on me, but I mean, he, you know, his land holdings are considerable. Uh, uh, in terms of the trust, trust that he has, that uh, he's been looking at various, or he's he's talked to a number of, of individuals, our friend Paul Pontieu as well, in terms of setting up, uh, you know, not megawatts worth of hydro as far as I know, but, you know, in hundreds of kilowatt range to be able to do interesting things such as create green hydrogen, for example. So, I mean, there are a number of, you know, kind of boutique one-off projects in and around the island. But as far as I know, the only one that's really putting out megawatts is the one and only uh, utility operated or utility uh, power purchase agreement. I forget if it's owned by Hel Helco or it's a long-term PPA uh, that's along the Wailuku River. So there hasn't been a whole, there's not a whole lot of hydro here. And, you know, the potential to do more hydro, I'm sure there are studies out there, Stan, I haven't been up on them relatively uh, recently, so I'm not really in a position to to comment too much. I mean, the, you know, the challenge when you talk about hydro is you have to have confidence that the water is going to be there when you need it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, anybody who lives in the islands knows there can be tremendous variation in water flow, and it happens because there can be variation in the rain flow. So, I mean, just, you know, point of fact, I've got a stream by my house that I love and love and love to go sit by and listen to the water go by and watch the water go by and it stopped running essentially in May. It came back briefly uh, several weeks ago for about a week or 10 days and it's, it was, it's been off since. So now we're in November. Uh, we got about half the rainfall that we usually do in October and November remains to be seen. So my point simply is, you know, there's a downside, like I said earlier, with every energy source, if you, you don't wanna go to town, bet all your chips on any particular one energy source, whether it's the geothermal, because we know Madame Pele has something to say about that. Uh, solar can be periods of, of prolonged cloudiness. The wind can also vary. So, you know, the, if you're a utility planner, you want to focus on the D word, right? Diversification yeah. and not put too many of your, your eggs in one basket, because that's just from a planner standpoint, that's just way too risky. So. The, the, the question is, you know, where do you put your big bets, right? Yeah. 
And well, I would I would add the big O also, and that's uh, overproduction. I mean, you almost have to overscale what you want to have to make sure you have uh, at least uh, the basics to get you through. So yeah, diversification and a little bit of overproduction in your planning factors is probably not a bad idea when you're talking about uh, renewable energy. So um, and find find a, the most cost effective, practical, reasonable, politically acceptable, socially acceptable way of storing the energy, you know? And to, to me, there's a case that, uh, again, the D word, right? Diversification. And uh, clearly battery storage has become very, very big just in the past several years. You've got major players, whether it's Tesla, LG Chem, Samsung, people, companies in Europe as well, and China, of course. Uh, so it's a vastly different world in terms of energy storage now compared to five, let alone 10 years ago. Uh, but we should, we put all our, all our bets on, uh, on batteries that use cobalt or use uh, nickel, use, uh, you know, these various chemicals, sometimes rare earth elements, which can be uh, hard to come by in terms of the supply, whether it's the Congo, whether it's the People's Republic of China. So, you know, I'm a big fan of diversification and Man, Stan, like you, I've heard stories for years and years and years about hydrogen being not so much a miracle fuel because there's really no such thing. You'd want to put it too much on a pedestal, but you know, to be able to find an energy source to be able to create green hydrogen cost effectively and be able to store it and use it and then transport it. I mean, that's kind of a holy grail. And uh, I think we all would like, uh, at least you and I would like to see it move a lot faster. And, uh, and you can speak to that a lot more than I can and uh, uh, couldn't happen soon enough. Yeah, I'm, I'm uh, known to be a little bullish on hydrogen, but uh, I'll take all the support I can get from anybody who also supported with me. Yeah, it's, it's amazing though, because you know the, the old um, saw used to be, hydrogen is the fuel of the future and it always will be. Right. And, but it, it's, it's actually starting to show up now. And I was just talking to an investment uh, advisor a little earlier today and um, her and her company, the analysts aren't looking at hydrogen here in the U.S. But I've been telling her you need to start looking at what's going on in Europe and Asia with hydrogen, because it is really, really, really taking off. Uh, even Airbus um, put on their website three aircraft they're designing right now to be flying in 2035, and all three are hydrogen, liquid hydrogen powered, and. One of them is a turbo, actually two of them are turbo, some kind of turbo engine, so jet engine that runs off hydrogen. And the third one is a commuter that can carry up to 100 passengers, 500 miles, also on hydrogen, but it's a turbo prop kind of a design. But Airbus, that's Boeing Aircraft's competitor. Right. Um, and in the UK, there's a company called Zero Air Avia that just flew its first commuter, um, 20, 20 passenger commuter airplane uh, on a completely hydrogen powered um, drivetrain, electric prop and everything. And so it's it's taking off and um, no pun intended taking off, but it's really uh, it's really gonna be the difference. And you know, as an aviator myself, I can tell you that when it comes to any kind of transportation, whether it's rockets, airplanes, ships, trucks, cars, it's all about weight. And being that hydrogen is 14 times lighter than air, you know, you got to compress it a lot to, to squish it into a container as a gas. But as a liquid, I just looked this up yesterday too. So if you, well, well the rule of thumb we use is a kilogram of hydrogen is equal in energy to a gallon of gasoline. But a gallon of gasoline is a fourth as energy dense as a gallon of liquid hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So you know how energy dense gasoline is because we use it in our cars right now and how, how flammable it is. But that's why hydrogen is rocket fuel. It's almost four times more energy dense than gasoline in liquid form. And, what's, and when, what, pressure, what pressure do you have to use to get it to liquefy? You have to take it in temperature, you have to take it down to minus 260 C. 
It's super cold. It's way colder than liquid natural gas. And um, so it's, it's a challenge, but they've got technologies now where there's almost zero boil off over a period of months, which has never, you know, over our lifetime, See, and it has a great safety record too. NASA has been buying liquid hydrogen from Canadian producers and putting it on rail cars and sending it from Canada to Cape Canaveral since the 60s. And you don't hear about big rail accidents where hydrogen leaks out and the community's you know, devastated or because it basically evaporates, goes up in the air and makes clouds. So, you know, it's, it's uh, going to be the future. I just, I'm, I'm really certain of it. And Sam, I know we don't have too much time, but let me ask you a really quick practical question. So you're on Oahu right now. If you wanted to, could you buy yourself a Toyota Mirai, number one? And two, if you were to buy one, obviously you would want some reasonable prospect uh, of being able to fuel it, right? Is, is that possible for the, the average Stan Osterman or anybody else who's interested in a, in a Toyota Mirai on Oahu to do right now? I, I could probably pull it off because I used to run the station on Hickam mm -hmm. and and I have access to Hickam as a military retiree. So I might be able to steal some from them. Right now, Servco Hawaii has a publicly accessible hydrogen station where they make green hydrogen off, off of solar power. Um, and it's available to vehicles that they lease. So they bring the Toyota Mirai in, they lease it, including three years worth of hydrogen. And in that three year period, they're trying to work with the state to figure out how to certify the metering of hydrogen into the cars. Because like, if you go to a gas station, all the gas meters have stickers on them from the Department of Ag, it says a gallon's a gallon, you know, and we certify right. that it's, it's accurate. So that's a challenge that's coming up. What's, what's really neat though, and I know we're gonna close pretty soon, you can buy used Toyota Mirais in California for like $12,000. And you could bring them over here and Servco could service them. And you could buy a small self-contained appliance that'll make your hydrogen for you. All you have to do is hook up the electricity in the water. It can make two or three kilograms a day. And those appliances are less than $100,000. So Stan, if you, get, if you get a used Mirai from California for 12,000, you should, you know, a couple thousand to bring it to Oahu, pick it up at Young Brothers, can you take your used Mirai and get fuel, get hydrogen from Servco? Right or now, not? right now they're not doing it because the state hasn't certified how to sell it. So it's really the state's fault has they haven't caught up. Servco is willing to. They when they opened the station, they announced that they want to sell to anybody. And Hyundai, Honda, and Toyota are in production. Mercedes, BMW, Ford, and GM are going to be in production with fuel cell cars in the next couple of years. So that's what you can look forward to. But it, that um, bringing bring in the used Mirais to the Big Island, don't be surprised if you don't see that happening within the next two years. I'm working on it with Paul and some other investors to make that available in Hawaii, including the fueling. So that's that's uh, to be to be announced at a later date. But that's what we're working on in secret secret dark rooms in in Puuvava. So. Well, Marco, thanks for being on the show with me today. And um, we'll have to have you back and, and talk a little bit more about some of your projects that you've got going on. But uh, yeah, thanks for joining us today. And for the viewers out there, uh, Stan Energy Man signing off until next week, Tuesday. Aloha.